welcome. Um, it's so nice to see such enthusiasm for poetry and at the end of a month of poetry. So <laughs> I'm delighted to see you all here. Um, we're going to read alphabetically by last name and I will do a very brief introduction which will be as follows. This is Charlie Barish. He's reading first. Please welcome him. <laughs> okay. Is this on? Not really. We did a mic check before. Is it trying to me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Thank you for coming out, everybody. And um, I'm going to read some poems beginning my new book, Home Movie. And I'll start off with a baseball poem. Maestro. Page number. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Page 41. It seemed just another minor league stunt, like between inning sack races and bat tosses, where the team's mascot, a guy in a cow suit, stomping on the opponent's dugout with oversized gloves and leaning over to squirt the player with water from his udders. So when the paunchy coach jogged out to sing the national anthem, and people rose just as they headed for the off-key barbershop quartet the night before, no one expected his lovely tenor, each syllable pure, unadorned, even the highest notes reverberating strong and sweet. Later from his coaching box, he sent runner after runner careening around third, his wood milling arm conducting them home, his music echoing through the ballpark. Mm -hmm. uh, can you move the um, microphone just a little closer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. How's that? So I think if, if this could be uh, yeah. <laughs> Page 34. A man and a woman are lying in bed. His leg stretches across her belly. His hand is a weight on her breast. In five minutes, they might be making love or they might be asleep. If 10 years ago he hadn't turned down a Rhodes scholarship to play baseball, he might be living in a Tudor cottage where I eat. This had been one of his dreams. If his arm hadn't broken down in the minors, he might be in a hotel room trying to sleep, thinking of tomorrow's game. If his boss's wife hadn't gone into labor this morning, two months early, he'd be at a meeting in Chicago. If her husband hadn't left her a year after they married, there hadn't been that party. She'd be watching TV now, and there'd be two or three kids upstairs sleeping. If her father hadn't gotten drunk, hadn't been so insistent that night with her mother in the Chevy, and if her mother had taken her mom's advice <laughs> and gone to that doctor in Puerto Rico, each of their lives has been a series of miracles. Now their eyes meet. Each thinks, this is the moment I've lived for. <laughs> this is Impressing My Therapist, page 25. <laughs> 
<coughs> what you're supposed to press it there. Free <laughs> title. Did I ever tell you I DJed an oldie show on the radio? I say to Mary, my fourth therapist of the year. <laughs> Amazing, she said, I never knew that. The next session, I tell her about the bareback barrel race I won riding a pinto mare. I got a blue ribbon big as Lord Fauntleroy's tie. I still have it. In the following weeks, I begin to make things up. <laughs> I, I caught a home run in the right field grandstand at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> the crowd cheered as if I were Mickey Mantle. I bet you didn't know I wrote a computer program that finds the rational root of a polynomial equation. I think this really wows her. I once won a pining contest. Charlie, you're incredible. Am I your favorite, I ask? You're very special, <laughs> but am I the most special? Can't you just pretend? <laughs> Everyone brings their own unique story, she says. It's time to find a new therapist, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is Early Spring in Vermont, page eight. There's only one thing to do when your car sinks to its axles in mud. Get out. Close the door. Kneel down and start eating. You will swallow fern seeds and mushroom spores, eggs with millipedes and ladybugs. Soon spring will crawl around inside you. Then get on your bicycle. <laughs> Healing, page six. We want to heal you, the teenage boy said as I gazed from the 17th century monastery's observation deck across Chancla Terra to the Mediterranean. From what I thought, then realized he'd see me walking with my cane. Five people encircled me. The boy's father introduced his wife, a younger son, a daughter. We're from Colorado, the father said. We'd be honored if you'd let us heal you. Do you suffer from MS? No, it's Parkinson's, I said. You're welcome to give it a try. Go ahead. <laughs> but their hands were already fluttering over my flowered shirt like a flock of birds. The father employed Jesus to free me from affliction, then asked if I were Christian. I said, no, Jewish. He shrugged and said, that's OK, you never know. <laughs> the family hugged me. When I entered the gift shop, the mother was buying a, post a, a little statue of St. Francis surrounded by sparrows. Oh. This is the dance, page 60. After my father lifts and pivots her into her chair and wheels her to the kitchen table, soup dribbles down my mother's chin to her bib, trickles onto her clean pressed dress. She says something that no one understands, puts down her spoon and takes up a pen. My father hovering over her once proud cursive, pronouncing each shaky word as it's written. A young woman observes from the counter. Black hair frames her lovely face, brushes her embroidered cashmere sweater, lips open and smiling, a photo of my mother at 20. From around the house, she watches at various ages. In a gown throwing rice in a wedding, and flowered pedal pushers playing softball, dancing at home with my father, his hand on her back, guiding her through the kitchen. Yeah. 
This is the Time Warner Motel, page one. I wrote this after my honeymoon with Andrea in 1991. The Time Warner Motel. When the next Bible was written, or the history of the world, the Garden of Eden will be the Time Warner Motel outside Ellsworth, Maine, where the portable sign says, blueberries and lawn ornaments, chocolates and fishing tackle, featuring Ruth and Wimpy's kitchen, home of the 495 Lobster Supper, where Wimpy was a busty Betty Boop tattooed on his bicep, not a cheap one either, and on his other arm, a woman with a snake stirs the lobster pot outside over a softwood fire. And Ruth serves it all in the dining room with real wood paneling and pictures of Elvis and John Wayne and paper placemats that tell you wrongly the state bird of Maine is the blue jay. And then gives you the key to number six where the concrete floor is covered with a thin green carpet and the glasses are sandy cleaned and the toilet seat has a ribbon around it. And in the morning, you can make love, watch Sesame Street while you get dressed, and give the key back to Ruth, who will bring you blueberry pancakes while Wimpy gets the fire started, while the sun rises over the ocean, and the state bird, the chickadee, whistles in the pines. Please make sure my children know I have been there, and my children's children. I'm going to read one more. This is from my first book, Dreams of the President, which, which consists of president dream, president's dreams. There's one for each president. And I'm going to close with a baseball poem from this book. This is William Taft's dream, and it's the Steve. The players like my ceremonial pitch, so when Walter Johnson's arm gives out, he points, beckons me from the stands. I hand my suitcase, suit coat to Helen, remove my tie and cufflinks, roll up my sleeves. An usher opens a gate, and when I step onto the grass, for a moment I'm confused. The crowd's roar surrounds me, and I feel weightless, as I'm lifted by an ocean surge. I'm afraid I've gone down with the Titanic, but then an urgent chant, Big Bill, shakes the stadium. I wave to the throng and ascend the mound. Cobb has never seen pitches like mine. The first two race past him, faster than Barney Oldfield, and he swings over a drop pitch by Hummingbird. Frank Merriwell strikes out two, and then it's Booker T. Washington's turn, but W.E.B. Du Bois pinch hit, shoves him aside. He glares as I wind up and uncoil like a cobra, and now the pitch buzzes in like an army airplane. He swings. And the ball sails into the sky, but I sprint across the outfield and snag it. <laughs> Helen comes out of the dugout. I ask her if I can stay and play baseball, but she says, no, I have to be president. <laughs> I throw my glove on the ground and follow her home. <laughs> books for sale in the back, and um, my new book is for sale, whole movie, and my previous book is for free, <laughs> um, Dreams of the Presidents.
While Sarah's doing that, I just want to say a big thanks to Sarah V, without which we would not be here, and you would not be able to hear us. So <laughs> there you are. please welcome our next reader, Judy Chalmer. check and see as people in the back you're okay great so thank you so much thank you to Beth Jacob Synagogue and to Poem City and to all of you my goodness what a wonderful poetry crowd on the last day of poetry month wow uh -huh. so um, most of my recent writing um, especially in my book that's back there, Minnow, uh, grows out of a deep affinity with the natural world, especially in this very particular environment with deep winters and lush temperate forests. So for 50 years, I've kind of considered my yearning to connect that affinity with uh, Jewish liturgical environments, fig trees and gazelles and uh, kind of desert wilderness uh, to be a failure. And, <laughs> until finally in my 70s, I sort of realized that 50 years of yearning to make that connection is the connection. <laughs> so I have begun to um, kind of explore the richness of yearning itself um, within the Jewish traditions and within this sort of era of Jewish history, as a member of a Holocaust survivor family, for instance, having been cut off from people and community uh, that are lost to the people and lost to me, lost to story itself, lost in their own stories. And personally within my family, growing up with a father who died when I was a baby, I created a very potent yearning that has lasted all these decades. And I'm now old enough to have experienced personal, many personal losses. So, and we live in a world in which there are, the natural world is experiencing catastrophic loss. So I've, I'm starting to understand uh, or explore yearning as a kind of heart opening to imagination, if nothing else, uh, but also to mystery, to the things that we can't know can never really reach, um, and even to love. So that's kind of a long-winded way to introduce the idea that I'm going to, the, the six poems I'm going to read um, are sort of focused on yearning. <coughs> Presence. I saw you the other day, but I didn't speak. Who was I, after all? And what would it mean, such looking back? Every day, I repeat this path, walking along the water. Across the distance, clouds nestled this morning beneath the peaks, and the peaks poof out over the clouds like powder, as if it weren't the gloom or a mist there, but the mountains themselves thinning, becoming transparent. Why does this comfort me? I wouldn't mind my disappearance if it were something like this gentle tempering. Boulders, mountains with names, whole ranges softened. Pine needles fleck the path. There's one on my foot. Earlier, peach and vermilion streamed across the sky and were gone in minutes. But you know this. Once you begin, you're never the same. I saw you again and thought of the vastness. A broad-winged heron beats overhead, its long legs mirrored in the trailing reeds below. How many times, how many years can a straggling heart bend and wait? There were stars, there were storms, everything lifted, lugged off. By now you must be far, very far away. 
How is it? It's been so long since you sent a sign, a word. Here in the sweet smoke, waiting for dark and the distant owl, I'm steeped in thick scent. This sharpness, this stinging I'll wear home, and a peace that I believe, dear one, belongs to you. A concept of the future. Dark blue footprints, my way forward disheartening. I was walking the shadows, striping the snow-covered meadow road. I wondered where I was. I could see the residue of the past, storms, trees tipped up at the root, and the in their woven baskets, arcing up over the pits where once they stood, boulders lifted, clutched impractically high, held beyond life, impossible as love. Skeletal nests, trailing wisps, once plush in spring, now winter flung, Curtains bedding blown off. All the departed, people I miss, and the ones I missed, born too late to know and bitterly miss that chance of knowing, all clear as birdsong. <clears throat> Departure for my father's ghost. They might have lingered, but I breathed and couldn't halt it. How like you they were, lifting silently over the snow. Ears turned, I'm sorry. I'm gonna start again, because I just messed those lines up. I printed this out in size 14 and I still mess, messed it up. <laughs> they might have lingered, but I breathed and couldn't halt it. How like you they were, lifting silently over the snow barely visible among the trees, dark coats, ears turned, noses wet and wondering. The young were leaping through the drifts. I'm making this up. How thick, how strong your legs were as we ran. How you looked back with such sorrow. The fallen trees lie about the frozen woods like giant scrolls. Tracks run everywhere between them, a looping script, one tail on top of the other, scents mingled, intention unreadable. Today, this strange still day, each crisscrossed line admits its impossible decision, pointing almost as if to explain how hard it was, why it happened. At last, the choice was made to leave so suddenly. Now light spills over the hills, and the trees are made uncomfortably bright, each branch a bold exclamation, its private life revealed. Turn here, bend down there, drop everything. All this unmasked in snow, while all around the sharp hooves plunge deep into shadow, hind legs springing forward, the woods so vast they might at last contain my long-buried yearning. Landscape. On the way to meet each infant grandchild. <coughs> Shift. Line of brow, of eyelash, wince of something taking up space in the belly, of cold, of weeping, of dark, and of light, of lifting, of swaying and bouncing, lines wrinkled and red, of wanting, of wiping, of ankle fold, of watching and <coughs> watching, of breathing and watching, of hoping, of padding, of shoulder, of center line, broken line, of breaking, of trusses and railings, of trembling, of going and going, of gripping, of letting go and speeding, speeding, not looking, just going and banging, reckless and weak, faster and hopelessly hard into love. Mm -hmm. 
of, I'm just smiling at, <laughs> I just know that we have this thing in common. Yeah. Um, of tangled, sleepless, a dried out hydrangea ball snaps off and rolls on the wind into the woods where it lives out the rest of its days untethered from its garden. That is, it finishes decaying, a few more petals breaking off every day, a tear at the edge of this one, a crack there, until gradually it's just a skeleton, and then not anything with a name that a casual walker might know. It may not make sense when it comes to decay to think, though, of finishing. The brittle hydrangea continues its process. All my life, I've thought of myself as a being in the world. But was I wrong? I walk in the woods. I try not to break off the trail. Am I of the woods? Am I of the trail? Am I of the world? Could that be what is meant by God's love? Last night I dreamt I was gradually losing touch. I remembered who and where I was some of the time, only enough to realize some of the time I hadn't. I had been somewhere incomprehensible. My children loved me. I could see that when I was clear. But I was losing them. I was losing everyone I loved. A short way into the woods, I'm trying to imagine love as much of the world as the beings that tumble through it. Minute by minute, I think this. Thank you. Our next reader, Adi Eo. Please welcome him. Thank you. I do not have a book. A loose leaf notebook. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all of these. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you all for coming. Thank my fellow poets for being here and making this such an occasion. Uh, we celebrated my, <clears throat> my father's yard site on Friday, so I thought it would be appropriate to begin with a poem about my father. Also appropriate because the theme of the poems that I wrote for the C.V. Wren March Arts Marathon this year had as their overriding theme, displaced persons. My father was uh, served on the Judge Advocate General Staff and was res partly responsible after the war for looking after the Jewish DPs in the American sector. First po poem is called Photobomb. In the photograph it is sunset in the late autumn of 45, Berlin, on the edge of what remains of Königsplatz, my father stands in his army great coat and garrison cap in the burnt out wasteland of the Tiergarten a few scorched trees clawing at the air, the carcass of the Reichstag getting scavenged. The war has roared past. My father's there to help pick up the pieces of the Jews. He squints into the camera as if trying to glimpse me, not a year old, on the other side. But also in the shot behind a concrete wall, I see a young girl crouching down, her blonde hair spilling from a black beret, who, at the moment of the shutter's click, lifts her head from hiding and smiles at the camera, and me beyond, and me beyond, as if we were looking just for her, <clears throat> a secret that my father shouldn't know. Uh, this is my take on the Humash in 
particular Exodus. What God said, I speak from stone, I speak from fire, I bring the plague and the flood, placate me with blood, still I harden hearts and level cities, slay the righteous and their babies, I scream across the universe, unconsumed in my desire, in my loneliness. To whom should I pray from relief, from the torment of being myself? What Moses said. I was only one of the people when you plucked me out of the wilderness. Blot them, blot me, and blot the book. Blot the memory of what I have seen and cannot bear and cannot tell. I want to be one of the people again. I gave you my blood, and now the only remedy for the torment of this unquenchable passion is death. God's love song to Moses. Mouth to mouth, I kiss you dead. I take your breath back to myself. You. I scoured the breadth of history to find. I teach you death, O oh my beloved, as you taught me love. I like sonnets. They're not always pleasant. <laughs> Necessary measures. They found a hole in time and scrambled through, refugees from the future. It's over up ahead, they told us, as they streamed along the road, dejected and bedraggled. We couldn't send them back, we didn't know how, and they wouldn't go along with us, needless to say, so what was left? We might have interrogated them, but who needs to be told there's a cliff when you've just stepped off it? Leave them, some said, they're deserters, just rabble. They'll turn into harmless soothsayers, wandering adrift, crisscrossing the highways, begging and babbling to no one who'll listen till they drop dead in a ditch. But on the off chance, these malingerers might stall the progress of the whole campaign. We shot them all. Um, this is the removal. Um, its specific reference is to the removal of the of Native Americans from the American Southeast. They emer they emerge from memory one sleeping evening in December, wading through the crusted snow, a family of Choctaws heaving the weight of women and children, the old and dying, on sledges across the crusted snowfield to the river landing, fugitive ghost breath lingering in the frigid twilight. The boatmen waiting beat their hands and swear at the ice flows, the weather, their fucking orders, their freight that shuffles as if in chains to the frozen shore. Silent in the dusk, without a sob, they board the bark, solemn as monuments. The boat casts off, leaving behind a wraith-like mist, their vanishing footprints, and the dogs howling in outrage, who will not be abandoned, but leap in after them and are swept to their deaths in the Stygian currents of forgetfulness. There it is. Ah. Um, this is my expression of um, environmental pessimism. I'm sorry to be such a downer after <laughs> Judy's wonderfully uplifting poems. It's called Bye Bye. <laughs> Today, spring has returned to an abusive lover. How many promises can I break before earth shuffles me off, done forever, turns me into the street and slams the door? Lizards may survive to mourn the manatee, 
Dogs may revert to wolves and multiply. None that remain will grieve vainglorious me. More than I would the hookworm or the tsetse fly. Done, done forever, I will suffocate on my own breath, drown in my own spew. Where I was, butterflies and club tails will proliferate, though I'll take some big game with me when I go. Intelligent life, opposable thumbs, I guess she won't try that again. <laughs> Let consciousness lift its bigoty head above the mean and in accordance with the horizontal scheme and the law of averages, she'll knock it back again. Take that prodigy and give it a good throttle. Cream rising to the top, shake the damn bottle. <laughs> How far is too far? How close is close enough? I got up to the edge of the world and couldn't stop. Take me back. But oh, sweet child, she cries. You played with life until it broke. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. OK, um, I'm going to throw this at you. Exodus. This is another DP poem. Out of the ruins we crept. The bookcases toppled, the pianos crushed and unstrung, the entablatures broken, their mottos illegible. It had gone on far longer than earthquakes or plagues, as if the stars had fallen on us, not one by one, but in a hailstorm of lethal diamonds each celestial missile leaving where once a tree, a brook, a child had been, a hole in the world for grief to plant a stone until nothing abided in us but rage that nothing was left to remember but grief and that a catastrophe had occurred. There was nowhere left but elsewhere and there we went without books or pianos, without mottos, hearts hard as fists, clenching and unclenching as we marched, wary of the ground we walked on, of the scorpions and spiders, pitching our tents in deserts of enmity and spite. Not here, not here, cried the crows, and the jackals, jackals howled, go elsewhere. Elsewhere became our destination. Elsewhere we chanted as we marched. Elsewhere, elsewhere, our hearts hardened to meet the hardened hearts we meet. And when we arrive at elsewhere, we will sing like the crows. We will scour it of jackals. We will write scriptures of rage. We will sing like the crows and raise scorpions and spiders. We will blot the stars and build walls of enmity and spite. We will season our bread with tears and caress our children with fists. And we will never forget the catastrophe because elsewhere, there is nothing else to remember. And this is a poem that I wrote in the first year of the, for the first arts marathon um, uh, in which I was dealing mostly with Images of asylum, <coughs> refugees. This is the children, and the setting, if you will, is the Rio Grande. In the evening dusk, the children emerge like ghosts from shallow graves. They shiver as they set foot to the water's edge, brave and hopeless, as heroes in a battle already lost. Continents behind them heave with the cannibal frenzy of a shark's womb. Ahead loom the gridded steppe lands or the bloated piles of homo humanitas in its latest swoon. Alone for love abandoned, they dare the rifts in the world, having no choice but pluck, no choice but to inhabit life to step out on the high wire of untested luck. Listen, 
you can hear the prayers they dare not utter. It is evening, and the children are crossing the water. So I thought I'd leave you with something a little bit, just a little lighter. <laughs> the door. Someone set fire to the men's room at Joe's bar. And the only thing remaining when it was all over were these words scratched on a stall door. For a good time, call this number. <laughs> the number had burned away. And though you'd see it every time you dumped, no one remembered or ever called. It was just part of Joe's scene, now a waste of ashes and embers. And not only Joe's, but the whole block, the entire city you knew like your mother's face, gone. We built a box for the door so we could carry it with us when we moved on. Nothing was left for us. But at least we can show our kids, when their spirits get low and the going goes bad, that there was a city once and a bar called Joe's and a good time was once to be had. Thank you. Um, for those of you don't, that don't know, um, uh, Adi kept referring to the March Arts Marathon, which is a fun. Put up your hands if you either sponsor someone in the marathon or participate in the marathon. So, those of you without your hands up, you have an adventure ahead of you next year in March, and it's a fundraiser for Central Vermont Refugee Action Network. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would love to do a one minute break where everyone gets to stand up and wriggle or bend or introduce themselves to their neighbor they don't know, and I will time you. We're halfway through. And it's good to move around and dry our tears or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And chatting and telling everyone how wonderful they are and meeting your neighbors is now over. So you all get to sit down again and hear three more poets. And then we'll have a question and answer. Judy will make an announcement she just told me about. And we'll nosh a little more. So, Nadel Fishman is our next reader. Please welcome her. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to start with a poem from my first book, Drive. And when I thought about reading at the synagogue, I realized that um, this poem is called Faith. Called what? Faith. Is this not? Yeah, we'll just move it closer. I need to be closer. Yes. You can can you hear me? It should be raised. Sarah, could we raise it? Oh. Let's try that. Is that, well, that's for you? Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Faith. The black beans soak to put them up an act of pure optimism. Tomorrow the cast iron kettle will simmer black water, will foam blue black. But for tonight, these closed jewels are a bridge to whatever rises with the light. I'm not saying I sleep easier, that my dreams collecting below the promised aroma of cooking won't chase me up and down the nightmare stairs, nor that the day outside the aura of the pot 
won't be a dizzying examination of that familiar nightscape. The handful of beans I toss into the water is good as any definition I know of future, noun seldom used in my childhood. <coughs> a time yet to be where I find myself now with a plan for a carrot, stalk of celery, cup of onion, all of which I gather together any time I hunger for blackness, beauty matched by the recollection of that thickness on my tongue, <coughs> scent of citrus. In an advance of optimism, I hold my ingredients at the ready, that I have pushed my cart through the dense aisles of shelved food, that I have picked my way through what is wilted, rejected what is not fresh. My prayer for the days to come, I repeat weekly. Food, not bags and boxes, cellophane and ink. Food, the rattle and heft of, a, of the still hard beans in my palm. A few black beans to eat, to draw my mouth around. This is where I stake my claim. I serve up the soup. Whoever enters will be fortified. In the same breath, there is black bean. There is future. There is nightmare. There's a pot on the stove to attend when I wake. And um, the rest of the poems are from my new book which came out in December, called Traveling, Traveling. And I'll start with this, the title poem, Traveling, Traveling. Oh, it's on page one. <laughs> <laughs> there were those let's get lost Sundays in dad's used clunkers, the olds or the caddy, announcing to the neighborhood our travels to distant realms, Jersey or Westchester County. Our late returns home after dinners and diners, or the Catskills Chinese restaurant owned by two old Yiddish-speaking women, kibitzing out back, refilling red and yellow squeezed bottles with duck sauce and hot mustard. At night, holding onto its sides, I traveled on the ship of my mattress, soaring through double windows, of the bedroom I shared with my seven years older sister, up through clouds, among the stars. How else to fall asleep in a house of contradictions where familial love between us tangoed with silence that fogged us in? Postcards arrived in the mail from rich relatives who traveled exotically to Miami Beach and Disneyland. They were the fallen twig from the family tree that up and moved to Israel, only to be swallowed up by the Dead Sea. The Brooklyn triple-decker where my Russian grandparents settled with their baker's dozen of kids and their wives, children, and husbands was so close we could hear each other's breath. But mom and dad would forever be the pioneers of traveling traveling as family legend would have it after they packed up their lives in a few sorry suitcases and turned their no longer youthful eyes from Brooklyn to move with three kids to the hinterlands of Queens, a <laughs> horde of relatives staring after them from the border. <laughs> This is a poem I wrote for my father, who um, was a cantor. And um, he was a cantor uh, most of my life. And uh, at 74, he took himself to cantorial school so that he could become an official cantor. Yeah. So I wrote this <coughs> poem for him after he died. My cantor sings no more. A page? Oh, I'm sorry, eight. There were all the nights of noise, and through the looking glass confusions of sleep, 
that childhood could not surmount. And you, stalwart sentinel of my dreams, my tall, broad-shouldered dad, you were the definition of comfort. Because when I woke, whatever the dream or nightmare, it was replaced by your living self. There was always more of you. The singing, talking, laughing man, you were sentient, larger than life. Two of my girl fingers fit into your wedding ring. Now time is moving, the living you into the past, and in waking there is nothing to replace that image, that sound. Sound fades, is not infinite as light that reports back in waves to earth from billions of galaxies, time after time. Your voice chanting La Dorvador from generation to generation will not be heard again. Memory's paltry engine could keep you here. That is one definition of nightmare. Nothing will return you to the world. Oh my. Two Hawks, Riverside Park. What page? Um, 17. In the photograph of the two hawks, the male on the higher limb of the London plane tree has a bloodied shred of a bird hanging from its beak, while beneath him, the female pecks at a rat's carcass splayed across a lower branch of that same tree. The rat's thin black tail underscores its transformation. The leafless tree stark against a cloudy January sky. I've carried death on my back, father, mother, one following the other until I'm bent under the weight of it. I remember as I stood by the plane tree, the male stared back, not eating, while the female continued to peck, black tail feathers pointing at the camera, then seesawing as her head bent down to tear and rise up again to eat. Time, I'm waiting for you. You do everything swiftly but death you do slow as a swimmer through mud. I walked on from the tree and forgot the dead bird, the rat, but not the hawks. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this poem. Um, it's in ten parts, and it's called Synagogues. Fifty-four. <clears throat> One. Ma never left the U.S. When I tell her where we're traveling next, China, India, Hungary, she looks as though I said, I bought the moon and stars, Ma. <laughs> Go sit in the synagogues, she says. It will be as if I'm there, too. Two. The first temple stood in Jerusalem where the ten tribes of Israel prayed until they were banished by Nebuchadnezzar II and the temple raised to the ground. It was 587 BCE. Three. In, 1950, in 1945, 3,000 Jews were turned away at every port, then welcomed with nothing but their faith to Shanghai. For many years, an elderly Chinese gentleman has been the caretaker and guide of the compound. We sit in the sanctuary and he tells their story. Each year, he says, the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of those Eastern European Jews return to the synagogue for a reunion. Of those 3,000, seven families are left. Gewalt. 
He speaks in combined Yiddish, Chinese, Hebrew, and English with a generous smile and a nod to incongruity. Four. There are 26 Jews living in Cochin, India, in a place they call Jewtown, and it isn't meant as a slur. The synagogue is laid out in blue and white tile with colored glass lanterns dang dangling from the ceiling. You can sit on benches along the sides. There are services <coughs> once a year on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Five. The synagogue in Budapest is ornate and brightly lit with shiny wooden pews. The many rows held the hundreds of Jews who prayed together before March 1944 when the Nazis invaded Hungary. Six. In an Orthodox synagogue in Rome, the men and women sit mechitza, separate. The women protected behind a wall of opaque white muslin. They chant the same prayers with the same intensity, but this way there are no distractions. <laughs> Seven. In Venice, the tiny synagogue sits in one corner of the walled ghetto in a small ancient square, its wooden beams darkened with age. The tall locked gate is gone now. Eight. At her table in Paris, my friend says, after 50 years, she returned to the synagogue where she was a bat mitzvah. She was the first girl in France to stand at the bima and read that day's portion of the Torah. When I walked into the sanctuary, she says, I felt I'd come home. Nine. God was already there when the Baptists bought the synagogue in Cambria Heights. They kept the stained glass windows, bright blue stars of David shining on the heads of a new congregation. It was the 70s, and barely a minion gathered, the old Jews gone to Hashem, the young ones wandering the world. 10. Saturday morning services were long and boring when I was a fidgety kid in Queens. I remember mostly old men in Talesim bobbing from side to side, davening, a few old women in gaudy veiled hats. At the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, it was also a Saturday morning, October 27th, 2018. The Kohan opened the ark and the gunman open fire. This is the last poem that I'll read and um, I was very happy to hear um, the poem that R.D. read about um, God uh, and the do-over. <laughs> this is the last poem in the book, it's on page 75 and it's called Lady's Slipper. If there were a creator of the universe, and if she were to begin again, having deemed the first draft, if not a failure, then in need of serious revision. <laughs> After light cracked its shell open against the sky, water trickled, then cascaded from every promontory, air breezed over forest tops and oceans, when she got down to the minutia and the architecture of a new, be a new being and new knowledge, there would be many do-overs. The apple's reputation resurrected apart from the snake and many successes to repeat in nature. And above all, she would know the lady's slipper to be among her most perfect designs and from its pale pink swelling sides as they curve inward on their veined way toward a secret, secret center. She would know it to be the template
for that part of a woman's body in which coexist her pleasure and her pain. Thank you. Now, next reader, please welcome Andrea Gold. hard acts to follow, I'll tell you. And I, I know, at least I know Nadell's and Charlie's poems really well, really well. I, RD's I only know from the March Marathon. Um, I'm going to start with a few poems that um, really are in memory of people in my family. The first one is How to Make Borscht, and it's in memory of my father, Gerald Gould. Weep as you chop more onions than you think you need. Snip bunches of feathery dill. Peel passels of beets until your fingers are red as rubies. Listen. When the soup cries out for more beets, more onions, another bunch of dill, give it what it wants. When it's time, Toss your memories into the soup pot. Let them simmer all day. Admire the color. Inhale the shtetl. I'm going to give you a minute to catch up with me. Here. Sorry. Okay. The next one I'll do is called Forgiveness. It, it's a longer one like that. I didn't collate, I just didn't think of it. And then I had three piles and they were all mixed up, so. Yeah. Forgiveness. My grandmother sewed 20,000 buttonholes by hand at the Gotham Dress Company. And pregnant on her wedding day, married the boss's nephew. Three children later, weighed down by disappointment and drudgery, she exiled my grandfather to the spare bedroom. Always a gentleman, he never complained, even when diabetes took his leg, even when he left a thousand dollar bill in his coat pocket at the office and it disappeared. True story. Sometimes in my dreams, I ride the elevator of my grandparents' pot roast scented apartment building Soup simmering on every stove, radios blaring, Tommy Dorsey, Yiddish sprinkled into conversations like paprika or kosher salt, apron women lean from windows, hang laundry on fire escapes, or call their children in. I wander through long abandoned rooms, hunting for something worth keeping, and find a cracked teacup brimming with forgiveness. <clears throat> Bianca's soup. This is her recipe for Brahm Baraka. Woody Czech mushrooms foraged each May in the Bohemian forest. Marjoram, half-inch squares of celeriac, carrots, parsnips, the pungent scent conjuring up the Jewish ball, 1938 Prague, where Bianca met George, white peau de soie gloves to her elbows, layered gown of organza and lace, satin shoes, he filled her dance card with waltzes and tangos, securing her destiny, both of them forgetting the brown-shirted men marching in the plaza. Mm -hmm. 
to read one more that has to do with the Holocaust. And this is a true story. It's called Heroines, and it's in memory of my cousin Leon Goldsteiners, who died a few months ago in <coughs> Grenoble. <coughs> When Miquet, usually a quiet dog, barked an urgent warning in the middle of the Paris night, Aunt Jeanette, silent as a mime, folded her husband into a wooden box. Only Miquet could hear his heart pounding when the Nazis arrived, smelling of cigarettes and death. Not finding Uncle Mendel, they marched out heavy boots grinding muddy outlines into the carpet. Crumpled and contorted, my uncle emerged from his temporary coffin, finding his wife collapsed on the floor, her mind shattered beyond repair, like a mirror broken into thousands of glistening shards. The next poem I'm going to read is called Late Bloomer. <clears throat> Wait till you find it. Okay. <clears throat> Called to take up the brush after reading Winston Churchill's painting as a pastime, George W. Bush now lives in a state of perpetual technicolor. <laughs> he used to look at the Texas sky and call it blue. Now he sees azure layered with cerulean and ultramarine. He never guessed he would find his inner muse, lose track of time, become one with the paint, the linseed oil, the palette knife, and those impossibly thin black sable brushes. Wearing his lucky beret, and paint splattered smock, George chooses indigo to outline his dog's adoring eyes in the tenth painting of the Barney series, then rearranges his slumbering cat Bob into a more captivating pose. <laughs> this is true. I actually researched it. It's true. <laughs> um, The next poem I'm going to read is called First Marriage for Tom. Too young, I donned a cotton eyelet Mexican wedding dress from Fred Layton's on 8th and Bleecker, the whole street smelling faintly of hand hewn leather, incense, and the promise of sex, leading us into a marriage that never had a chance. I flew across the ocean with my new Glaswegian husband to an old flat in Edinburgh. Stone steps smooth and concave from 200 years of weary feet ascending. 1971 was the year of eating ancient grains with Job's tears, tiny pearls of barley burdened by their name. We balanced tubs of yogurt tins of milk, single eggs, and growing discontent on the kitchen windowsill. Relieved when the unruly wind didn't scold us by tossing it all down to the patch of grass four stories below. But we couldn't stop our burdens from sprouting wings and soaring into the pewter sky like ravens, settling into the rugged landscape surrounding us, air heavy with the scent of coal and sheep. And this poem is called Second Marriage. <laughs> For David, 1950 to 2012. That's a, not the date of the marriage, it's the date <laughs> of his life. <laughs> You offered me sushi like an exotic bouquet, taught me to sit Seiza style on a tatami mat and balance smooth black chopsticks between thumb and forefinger. 
You were cubes of rosy tuna, dipped into shiru, mixed with green mustard. You were hot sake, sipped from a small porcelain cup. You were jellied fish eggs, orange as marigolds, glistening like jewels, sweet, salty, slippery. You were a shoji screen, rice paper framed by a lattice of bamboo, hiding your interior spaces. You were mysterious as our brief marriage until I read your obituary years later, survived by partner Brad. And the last poem I'm going to read is called Spring in Three Parts. One. Lilacs don their flouncy spring dresses, seductive as sirens, with their purpleness and crazy scent, never needing to check themselves in the mirror, having no regrets. Two, she's not known for her apples, but the old apple tree has a good cry every spring, white crepe paper tears, raining down on unfurled hostas, emerging ferns and forget-me-nots, soon disappearing without a trace. Three, careening out of control, taking the curves on two wheels, spring, emboldened, no longer mint green or shy, leaps dizzily over the precipice, strewing tulip petals and dandelion fluff in her wake. Thank you. Yeah. This is Nikki. Nikki is and I'm the last reader, Nikki. <laughs> so, uh, this is a prose poem, as in, it's a paragraph. Dragons. The sea can freeze into sludge, God's slurry. And this has always happened. So we find ancient rose petals at the bottom of sea canyons where dragons linger with sharks. Their frosty attitudes sparkle in thin streams of sunlight. They're ready to catch us and keep us and eat us, sprinkling us first with powdered ginger root following a Chinese recipe. Oh, sorry, with powdered ginger or following a Chinese recipe flavoring us with ginger root. <coughs> the dragons especially favor Chinese food because, the dragons say, the Chinese appreciate them and are never foolish enough to deny the dragons' existence. But even the dragons, but even the Chinese, the dragons say, don't realize that dragons have gills and can live in marine depths as well as dreams. These are antique matters, things to be pondered over generations, while we worry about a paucity of snow, or too much rain, or heat, the Earth's upheavals. God leaves the possibility of survival to us, as God always has. It's one thing to create, another to ensure survival. Keep the world tidy. This poem is like so about this moment, like my front porch is covered, our front porch is covered with like mosses and uh, bits of straw and stuff. So, you'll understand. Keep the world tidy. Raggedy robin's nests perch on our porch rafters, poised to provide a home to shelter a family. Who am I to tidy up the world, sweep away unruly wisps of robin straw, deadhead marigolds and pansies, kill mice? Our cat bats each one, teases and toys while the mouse plays dead. I pluck up the cat. Sometimes the mouse scarpers away, poised to populate our home. When do we protect ourselves and from whom? in celebration. And this is a poem for Andrea. In celebration. 
The farm dog appears on the hill, barks, snarls, teeth bared. He rushes in, for, he rushes forward, darts in, snaps at Gilly. I scream at him. Gilly barks at him. He bites at Gilly's tail. Andrea steps forward. Don't get between them, I yell, but she's not deterred by him coming at us mean as winter. By sheer force of character, she leads him back up the hill to the farmer, then plucks long strands of Gilly's tail from the road mud, lays those wisps on the snowbank, a shrine to our fright, to her success. Gilly and I are here to tell you there are heroes in our midst. We never know when we are lucky enough to walk alongside one. Um, vitreous detachment, that's those little floaters that we get in our eyes. Ignore it, Dr. King, my, op Dr. King, my op ophthalmologist instructs. You will get used to it, and then you won't see it. Ignore the skyscrapers of ice dropping into the seas. Ignore the skin-thin polar bear slipping into the steaming sea. Ignore the tanks that rumble toward us. Ignore our bathtub that dangles over the lip of our second floor. Against winter fields, my right eye sees my vitreous detachment soar like the shadow of a lost snow goose. Against spring green, I'll see it as my teardrop on the kitchen window. And about eyes, um, April 13th, I had an operation on my eyelids so that I could see more. And what I discovered was that I could not see anything and I couldn't read for several days. So I started writing haiku and dictating them into my phone, which was really fun. And now I obviously can see again, which is nice, and I actually can see a lot. So I'm just going to read a few of those haiku and identify them by date because that's when I wrote them. So I've been writing one every day in April. Uh, 13th of April. The surgeon tightens my eyelids. Look, the top maple branches. 14th of April. Snow cloak dissolves. Crocuses rise. Old knees dance. 15th of April. Honking geese return. Herald our own future griefs. 17th of April, black stitches swallowed by puffed eyelids, hidden script. 19th of April, branches bent by winter snow bow to marsh marigolds. 22nd of April, we circled the village, our dogs sniffed for their perfect spots. Uh, where am I? 27th of April. Friends disagree together. Again on the 27th, I got into doing this. Cradles of clouds rock above the cemetery. Then, blue skies. That's it. Thank you. So we thought, we thought we would have a fairly brief but lively or whatever if answer questions if you have them and you may have noticed our, our video person here, Orca, has been uh, filming this so it would help him if the readers could sort of just move some chairs or the chair and sit in front and people could ask questions and then we'll have a little nosh, hang out, and everything. So thank you, everyone. Um, 
And we'll do that, we'll speak up and do it without a mic, because... myself too much. Um, and um, I also wanted to acknowledge this particular gathering of Jewish poets mm -hmm. and what could I put together that would be somewhat coherent uh, in relation to that. Well, I, I chose four poems that related to being Jewish and to my Jewish experience. But <laughs> Really, other than that, it's really it's just overwhelming deciding what to bring. <laughs> it's, it's almost, you know, it's just overwhelming. I tried to bring, not bring out of season poems because I have, you know, poems that have to do with the fall and the winter. I left those home. I think. But, oh, and you know, the marriage poems, it's just arbitrary, really. <laughs> say greatest hits because <laughs> they were such wonderful ones. <laughs> the other ones are too. So. Um, I knew I wanted to start with prose and end it with haiku and I was reading poems that I recently revised for the marathon so I wanted to hear how they sounded. And God tends to come in sometimes that seemed appropriate. <laughs> A Jewish poem, a DP poem, an asylum poem, and the rest were the, mostly the poems that gave me the most trouble. <laughs> That'll show <laughs> Well, I, like Judy, um, sort of thought about my work and what was appropriate to this gathering and um, what might resonate for other 
people in the, uh, in the synagogue. So. One thing I did was choose poems that I hadn't read publicly mm -hmm. in a while. Other questions? Charles, you, you opened up with baseball, which was, you know, April is baseball season. So it's the perfect for the season. Yes, and from a Red Sox fan's perspective, it's the cruelest month. <laughs> <laughs> Before we evolve into <laughs> every year. <laughs> Can I also say that Charlie made this shirt in the fabric he bought in Jerusalem? Wow. So I thought he should wear it today. With, he went to Israel with his mother, I don't know, 15 years ago. Wow. That's wow. That makes a, you the embodiment of something. <laughs> I was admiring that shirt. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thinking, boy, yeah. Puts us all sartorially to shame. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Yes? I have a question. Um, what does being a Jewish poet mean to each of you? How do you see your Judaism and your identity as a poet, if you identify as a poet, when you're laughing? Gee, I'm glad we're starting with Judy over on the right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the the question that is the a very deep question thank you for it and i'm sure i won't do it justice and uh, but i could go on and on um and won't um it you know all the aspects that make up who we are um royal around you know, in the questions that we ask. And so, you know, I very deeply identify as Jewish. One, I, this, I, okay, here's a way to, here's a way to f focus it and frame it. Um, I'm really, really curious about the difference between poetry and prayer. Um, and I, uh, the closest I've been able to come to any way of thinking about it is that I, I look for poetry in prayer, but I don't look for prayer in poetry. Um, in the sense that I think prayer has some really specific goals, and poetry uh, is more open-ended than that. Um, sometimes I try to write poems about prayer, but I'm not drawn to writing to prayer. Uh, it's just, it's really fascinating. And um, since you asked, maybe afterwards, I would love to hear your thoughts. But while I'm saying this, it reminds me that I wanted to say that um, it could have been a year ago that Michelle Clark, who's in the back there, sent out an email saying, have you heard about this new hub for Jewish poetry called Yetzi Rob? Do you remember that? No. Oh, well, it was just something. You must have come across yeah. your, you know. Yeah, I yeah. send things out when I see And it um, it's a really interesting thing. It's not that old. And they're, they're gathering. They have a directory that, you know, you can go on if you are a Jewish poet. You know, and you can look somebody up. And they gather people for readings that are sometimes online and sometimes in person. And they're going to have a summer conference. Wow. Um, I'm kind of. Uh, excited about it, and um, it made me think about what it would be like to gather a wider network of Jewish poets in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, um, cool! Wow. What was it called? Yetzira. It's Y E T Z I R A H, <coughs> which is is one of the varieties of of creativity. Well, I have to say, I. I don't really think of myself as a Jewish poet. I am Jewish and I am a poet, but I never really thought of myself as a Jewish poet. And so there was a little part of me about this gathering that was a little bit, you know, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, not because, I, I mean, I relish my uh, Jewish culture. I do, or it's in my poems a lot. 
but I think of my, and I, the same way I don't think of myself as a woman poet, necessarily, I think of myself as a poet. So it's, you know, it's sort of narrowing the, the, the lane rather than opening it up. You're looking at me. Go ahead. What are you? Well, having spent many years trying to be an Irish poet <laughs> with no success, <laughs> I realize um, that I enter history as a Jew. I really don't have much to say about that. I ride into history along with the Jewish people. And uh, so, I mean, a lot of my, a lot of what I write, as you may have noticed, is a struggle with the fact of my being a Jew. I don't like Jewish, by the way. Um, um, and there's nothing ish. <laughs> um, I, so I, I, I struggle with being a Jew and wondering what my responsibilities to and for the Jewish people are. Um, and I don't think all of my poems have Jewish reference, but um, that's, that's my answer. It's my response, a good question. Well, I come up with, I come to the question as a convert, which means that there's a lot of common personal Jewish history that often people share, you know, your story of your poem with your story about the big exodus to Queens, and Michelle has written about moving from the Lower East Side to Queens. It could as well be both places could be the moon to me on many levels, including um, sort of recent Jewish history. Um, so um, I think I yeah, imagery will come to me from the liturgy. Um, I certainly think about God a lot, a lot actually, in one way or another. I'm not a very religious person. Um, I think there's as many kinds of Jews as there are everyone else in the world, and that's where I fit in there. So I don't know. I'm not averse to the question. I don't. I don't have anything more intelligent to say about that. Sorry, Charlie. I don't either, and uh, <laughs> I feel lucky if I write a poem that ends up being about Judaism or um, as, a Jew, as a Jewish reference. But uh, if that's where the muse takes me, then it's there. But I don't really strive to write Jewish poems. Um, I, I'm not religious at all, but I'm culturally, I identify very much with being Jewish and with my family, of, you know, extended family background and all the people. And so I think a lot about the people and my experiences and I take from that and, you know, oftentimes want to write about something related to my cultural Jewish experience. but. Since I've only been writing poetry for 10 years, I'm kind of a, basically I'm a, I'm a woman who writes poetry and I happen to also be Jewish, but you know, I, I get a kick out of bringing in my Jewish cultural background to my, to my writing. Thank you. Yes. I don't have as deep a question as what's been posed here so far. Um, 
But I um, was very curious about the story in your poem, Judy, that related to Andrea about as a heroine. Um, Nikki. Oh, Nikki. Nikki. Yeah. Yes. Could could you share the story with that? In the, poem. The, the story was the poem. Andrea and I went for a walk with our dog, with only with my dog. Right. Didn't and have what dog. happened exactly? Uh, my dog is a rabble rouser. Oh, okay. He barks at everyone. But he's actually sweet, but we met another dog who was definitely on the oh, attack. Okay. And Andrea saved our lives. And <laughs> That was wonderful. <laughs> but sheer force of calmness and character. Yes. Thank it's really you. great. That was the story. Thank you. And we have a walk that road again. <laughs> <laughs> and we will not. <laughs> Tell us which road it yes, was. Which <laughs> it's the road along by the recreation field in Plainfield. Oh, yeah. By the river. A great road to walk on them unless you happen to Without have a dog. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Uh, with um, President Company Excluded, do you have a favorite um, Jewish poet? It's amazing how every other poet comes into my head when you ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Well, I love. Um, Edward Hirsch, um, Gerald Stern. I was just going to say Gerald Stern. Yeah. yeah. Um, Grace Paley. Grace Paley. Yes. Yeah. Grace Paley. It's one of those questions, by the way, that makes you freeze and not be able to think of anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Marge Piercy. Charlie, your favorite. He's like Denise Levitov? No? Nadell thinks Denise Levitov is your favorite. Well, one, one, of, <laughs> one of your favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah. I, I, I've only tried to, I've only submitted a few poems ever to be published, and I, they, I had two poems taken by a now defunct publication called the Jewish Women's Quarterly. And one of my poems that was in there, Marge Piercy had a poem at the same time, and that was my greatest pride. <laughs> <laughs> being in that thing with her, <laughs> being in her company in that journal. Yes, over there. Um, that big question, but why did you write poetry? Do you feel compelled to? Do you have fun writing poetry? The question is, why do you write poetry? Do you feel, feel compelled to? Do you have fun writing poetry? Not always. Yeah. <laughs> not, not always, always fun, fun or not always compelled? Not always fun. Not always fun. Always compelled? Always. always yes. Compelled. Right. Yeah. Um, that's how they get made. Poem, for me, is like a, it's a box. Um, and it must be, it's a made thing. It doesn't happen naturally. It's not really spontaneous. It's an object carefully made of words, and it should be capacious enough to hold all kinds of understandings and meanings. Uh, but it must be a, a, a carefully made and a beautiful box, a beautiful container. Mm. Nice. Mm. I, I recently um, saw a film of Ruth Stone's life, and she's, she, her contention was that poems just came through her, like right. a breeze just blew through her. <laughs> and I thought, gee, I never had a breeze before for me that had a poem in it. I mean, you know, it's work. You know, I mean, it's work. It's, it's, what, it's what I do. It's my work. Um, Baron Wormser, who's another one of my favorite Jewish poets, uh, mm. 
and he's a friend also, a local person, but he said that a poem is an emotional errand. And I really resonated with that because the kernel of the beginning of a poem is something, you know, that maybe, you, you know, something happens or you think about something or you think about, a, you know, an event that happened. The creation of the actual poem is, you know, a lot of work and revision, revision, a lot of revision. But, you know, the initial impulse to me is often turns out to be my, the two poems I wrote about the first two marriages, to me, that really helped me have closure about each of those marriages. And it, it honored them in a certain way, even though they were very brief and not successful. So, you know, that's how I feel about a lot of the things I write, is that it honors a person or a situation or an animal, whatever. Yeah. I find writing poetry fun. And, um, and I love coming up with a metaphor. Um, I say coming up with it, it discovers me in a way. Um, yeah. Let me slip up. Yes, it is fun in a way. Um, it's what Yeats calls the, the fascination of what's difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I concur with Charlie. The, it is fun, but it, is, um, it, it can be very punishing fun. Remember uh, what Hemingway said about writing? He said, it's easy, you just open a vein. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. uh, you, know, you remember what Dr. Johnson said about writing. What? Only a fool writes except for money. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I um, have a very difficult time starting to write. For some reason, it just, uh, it's hard to get going. But I love language. I love language. And so the process of playing with it once, once there's something there is really, really pleasurable. So, so let me ask you. How do you balance writing with reading, oh, specifically boy. poetry? That is a real another one of those gigantic questions. <laughs> like oh, so short. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it's really interesting because sometimes when I'm writing, I'm not reading. Um, almost specifically, it's not even an intention. It's almost like entering this different zone. Um, Reading is, it's, um, it gives you so much permission. You know, I remember when I first started reading poetry, I kept saying, you mean you can do this? You mean you can do this? You mean, you know, and, and th they're all invitations to start, so, yeah. I was startled by how panicked I was when I couldn't see, which I knew was temporary, um, that I couldn't write. I, I knew I was panicked about not being able to read. I was in a huge panic about not being able to read. But when I figured out I could write on my phone, dictating, it was a huge relief. And that tells me something about um, but a very, I find writing tremendous fun. I find my thinking about myself as a writer very painful. So, you know, <laughs> you know I, I see my faults and they're, they're crippling. But a lot of it is that it, despite myself, I find out things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's discovery for me. So. And I've seriously taken up learning how to paint, and that is a whole different thing. And I don't, I learn a whole bunch of different stuff, but I don't learn the stuff I learn when I write. So. I think maybe one more question, and then we'll um, eat, talk, we have books for sale, et cetera. Yeah, so one more, but that's a second question for me. So if there's another one has a first? No? Okay. It's um, yours. Last year, Judith, I heard you and Adam at 
when you were pairing up with the Asian poet. Her name? Michiko. Michiko? Yeah. That was a wonderful event. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if anybody else, uh, barring you know, this event where you're kind of sort of together, but um, have you done any collaboration as poets? Well, I, I don't know about collaboration, but um, Judy and Charlie and I have been writing together since 1988. <laughs> so we, we have a, a lot of history of, uh, of helping each other's poems be realized on the page. And I've been in a poetry group with Jesse, who started our poetry group eight years ago. And we meet once a month, and we work a lot with each other, and sometimes write a poem together. Mm -hmm. I'm not very bit good at collaborating. <laughs> 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 not so much. <laughs> but I've also been meeting with them in the middle, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I didn't even know that R.D. was a poet until he signed up for the Marching Arts Marathon. And I just was running around the house saying, Barbara, you have to read this. Barbara, you have to read this. You know, my socks. So there are like hidden poets here coming out of Cabot. It's really nice. Wait, wait, wait. How many people in the audience are, po are write poetry? Oh my exactly. Oh, that's, that's remarkable. That's a good place to transition into conversations. <laughs> 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 <laughs>